Welcome to POTUS 2016, where we keep watch on the Oval Office and pour cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, a look into the cabinet. We examined some foreign policy nominees in an earlier program, and we'll revisit that expanding list in the future. But today, we focus on Donald Trump's choices to carry out domestic policy. Also today, in our evidence-based politics segment, a scholar who fears making America great again means dismantling LBJ's great society. To begin, let's run down the list of domestic nominees so far. EPA, Scott Pruitt, Oklahoma Attorney General, named according to press reports. Close ally of the fossil fuels industry, currently fighting climate change rules, part of a 28-state lawsuit against Obama regulations. Housing and Urban Development, Trump's choice, neurosurgeon, former presidential candidate, Ben Carson. The job of HUD secretary, to develop affordable housing and oversee fair housing. Carson has no government experience and has said poverty is a choice that private groups should address. Education secretary, billionaire Betsy DeVos. The job, largely a bully pulpit and in her case to push charter schools vouchers for private schools, and local control. She was Michigan GOP chair and an activist for school choice. Health and Human Services, Georgia Congressman Dr. Tom Price. The job, repeal and replace Obamacare, reform Medicare and Medicaid, oversee food and drugs, and medical research. Transportation, Elaine Chow, George W. Bush's labor secretary. The job, build stuff. Trump wants to spend on airports, roads, bridges, transit. Easy confirmation. Chow is experienced and is married to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Commerce. Billionaire investor Wilbur Ross. The job? Odd Combo. The Census. Economic Analysis. And NOAA. The Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Like Trump, Ross wants to fix trade deals and hit China with tariffs. Treasury Secretary? Steven Mnuchin, the job, borrow billions from the financial markets to keep government running, oversee the IRS, help rewrite the tax code. He's ex-Goldman Sachs and chief Trump fundraiser during the campaign, but also has donated to Democrats and worked for liberal billionaire George Soros. No government experience. And finally, Attorney General, Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions, the job, carry out Trump's law and order agenda supervise the FBI, and enforce civil rights laws, once rejected as a federal judge for racial remarks. And that, pending okays by the Senate, is the cabinet so far on the domestic side. No labor secretary yet as we speak. What does all this add up to? Well, joining us, three guests. Orrin Cass is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, the conservative think tank, where he focuses on anti-poverty policy, energy, and the environment. He was domestic policy director for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign. Also here, Joseph Vitteritti. He chairs the Urban Policy and Planning Department at Hunter College. A specialist in education, he's advised school leaders in New York, Boston, and San Francisco. Among his shelf of books, Summer in the City, John Lindsay, New York, and the American Dream. And with us via Skype from California, Tamara Drought, Vice President of Policy Research at Demos, the liberal think tank. Most recently, she's written Sleeping Giant, How a New Working Class Will Transform America. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And Tamara, to the title of your book, I have a feeling this is not the new working class you had in mind or the transformation <laughs> you thought they would make. Well, let's say this, that I think it's more a coming rise of the new working class. But, you know, I think this working class, the working class was fundamental to this election, but it was not really, it was the old idea of the working class, right? It was the industrial era, people like my dad, who was a machinist. We still have this very outdated image of who the working class is today. And um, this new working class are janitors, home health aides, 
um, restaurant workers, fast food workers. The service is industry. really beginning. The service industry is really making its mark in our politics. Didn't work out this time around, but you know we have movements like Fight for 15 and the Dreamers and Black Lives Matter that are actually delivering real progress in um, cities and states. And we will see over time how Trump policies work for the new working class. Will they serve the, the service industry labors. as um, he hopes they serve the old industrial working class? And we'll get to the Department of Labor as we go. But Orrin Kess, I want to ask you about this EPA nominee, uh, not officially named, but being reported by multiple news organizations. Uh, ha have you heard of Mr. Pruitt since you're an energy expert yourself? And I gather coming from Oklahoma in that position and part of that lawsuit by a number of states against Obama regulations, he's, I don't know if we can say a skeptic about the existence of climate change, but certainly about the way the government's been going about dealing with it. Well, Scott Pruitt, as you said, is is probably leading uh, a lot of the litigation against uh, the Obama era regulations coming out of the EPA, and in particular spearheading the 28 state uh, suit against the Clean Power. So plant. leading that, he's not just one of a big group of 28 attorney generals. You're saying he's a leader of that group. He is, and and I think it's important to recognize it's not some sort of outlier, narrow movement. It's the majority of states, and and he's really taken on a leading role there. Um, does his role potentially change when he's EPA administrator? Because after all, Oklahoma is an oil producing state. Um, they have the most uh, climate change denying senator, James Inhofe, and that's consistent with the interests of Oklahoma, one could argue. Once he becomes EPA administrator, does he broaden and professionalize in that role, or there's no way to tell? Well, the role of the EPA administrator is primarily to enforce and write regulations regarding our environmental statutes. Um, one of the main problems with what the Obama administration has done is aggressively pursue climate change when that's not really core to what those statutes were aimed at in the first place. So it's perfectly Although the court sided with Obama on that, right? They, they let this carbon emission uh, problem be called pollution, even though I understand the argument you're making. We think of pollution as smog and ozone and things that make us choke. This is sort of invisible and has a potential long-term effect on the planet. But, but the Supreme Court has said, yes, this qualifies as pollution under the law. Well, and that was all the way back under the Bush administration. The Supreme Court has stayed the Obama administration's attempt to use um, some unconventional interpretations of the act to go after the problem very aggressively. So uh, certainly having an EPA administrator who has priorities other than climate change is not inconsistent with historically what you'd expect the EPA to do. All right. Education. Betsy DeVos. All anybody says is she wants vouchers and charter schools, but you were telling me off the air there's another big function of the federal education department. What is it? Well, the whole issue of charters, uh, of, um, of, of um, standards, is, is being widely debated nationally now. Um, the Common Core, uh, which is... Uh, some people misunderstand it as a federal attempt to impose standards, but the Common Core is really de de uh, devised by the governors, and it was it was a an attempt to define what children should learn at particular grade levels. Uh, it's in very important for standards uh, because if you don't decide what children should learn, it's very hard to evaluate how much they've learned. Um, the, uh, the debate going on in standards now is partially a, a reaction to testing uh, and the question about the Common Core and, and teaching standards and learning standards is whether the federal government should, imp should design them, whether the state should design them, whether localities should design them. The, um, DeVos hasn't said very much about that at all, so we're really not clear where she stands on it. She's, well, why, she was a supporter of Jeb Bush who is very much aligned with the Common Core, um, but she hasn't said much. Trump, to the extent that you could believe what he says and that he meant it, uh, seems to be very against the Common Core. And can the federal government affect uh, the availability of vouchers if a conservative movement is to, you know, allow kids or families really to uh, use tax dollars, tax credits, or physical vouchers, or however they want to do it? to pay for private school. Federal Can Betsy DeVos and Donald Trump bring that about in a widespread way? The federal government provides about 10% of the education budget. 
so they can make a difference in states that really want to do it to begin with. So um, over 40 states have charter schools now. And, and choice is not a Republican or a conservative issue. Choice, uh, certainly charter schools was supported from every president since Clinton. Uh, vouchers is more controversial, but there are even people who, who define themselves as liberals or progressive who support vouchers for poor kids. What's different about Betsy DeVos's position on, on, on vouchers and choice is it involves very little accountability to the government. As someone who studies anti-poverty legislation, that's a lot of what the Education Department does too, right? Title I funds, which are for schools with a lot of children in poverty, mm -hmm. um, anti-poverty program, a major one, right? Well, that's right. And, and you know, it's true that only about 10% of education funding is federal. When you start talking about those most uh, at-need districts, the most at-risk students, the share gets a lot higher. And so one very interesting policy question at the federal level is, do you allow those funds to move around to facilitate choice, or do you hold them in the public schools, which can really frustrate choice? And so Title I funds could be removed from some public schools and follow the child, in effect, and that's where some voucher money would come from? Right. So that's something Governor Romney proposed in 2012, was that essentially children who were eligible for Title I directly or who helped make their districts eligible could bring the funds with them in their backpack, so to speak. Meaning if a child who was eligible for Title I funding wanted to go to charter school, that funding should follow him. If there was a voucher program, that funding should go into the voucher. Housing and urban development, Ben Carson. Blank slate, nobody has any idea. Coming out of medicine and with no government experience, I don't think he's written a word about federal housing policy. Um, I know people say he's commented uh, in a negative way about one of President Obama's housing integration programs, but we really have no idea, or is there anything more you can say? We don't have any idea because he hasn't had anything to say about it. He certainly doesn't have any learned knowledge about it. We haven't heard the President-elect say much about it. Um, what brings them all together, which is somewhat frightening, is this view that government should not be involved in helping people who are struggling. And that's the big difference between them, the new administration, and what we've seen since the Great Society. That government has not only a role but a responsibility to help people who are struggling. And these two, two departments we're talking about today, Department of Education, going back to ESEA Title I, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development are, are major instruments for implementing those compensatory programs. So HUD finances housing authorities. So, it, uh, and housing authorities are struggling the way uh, right now with lack of sufficient funding. HUD provides housing vouchers for people who are, uh, who are poor to have access to affordable housing in the private sector. HUD, under Obama, started to implement uh, a provision that would promote uh, better integration by, by income and class. And that issue ties together education and housing because we do know in situations where you have integrated schools, kids who are falling behind do better. There's, there's evidence to suggest that. And an approach through housing gets us beyond the kinds of integration wars we had back in the 80s with busing. I mean, it, it, it's a very sound policy for moving the ball forward. Except people in largely white neighborhoods don't want housing integration forced on them any more than they wanted they school don't. integration. They don't. Well, right? it's more subtle. I, I think we're seeing some, I mean, we're seeing some experimentation in New York now with a housing development that includes mixed income housing and it seems to be coming about. I mean integration is not an easy issue. I think it's a it's the easier path to follow than what we did in the 1980s with school busing. Interesting. Which was a, a real backlash. Tam, Tam, we hear so much about vouchers in all these conversations. Vouchers for schools which is considered a conservative policy. Vouchers for Medicare 
from the HHS secretary. Instead of Medicare, vouchers to buy private insurance for seniors, considered a conservative policy, very scary to progressives. Uh, vouchers for housing, Section 8, ah, that's a good thing. Why, why, is vouchers, why are vouchers liberal in some cases and conservative in others? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question. I mean, housing is so complex, right? And I think the idea behind vouchers for housing is to allow people to go to um, be in housing that fits their needs for jobs, for schools, all of that. I think, you know, with the public school system, what we have seen is real inequality across districts, across neighborhoods. And that's really connected to the fact that we continue to fund our school system from the property taxes. Um, and as long as we continue to do that, we will have inequity. I think the problem that progressives have with charters for um, public education, for K through 12 education, is it actually further takes resources away from the broad-based funding of what should be an equitable, good quality public education system for all. Frank, um, we're going to run out of time in a few minutes. No, I think it's a question of... Uh, Oren, or, or, go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to address something that they, they both said, which is the idea that somehow, you know, Trump's nominees either don't want to help poor people or don't think government should help poor people. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think what's really going on is that they're looking at some of these programs that exist and recognize that they're complete disasters. I mean, public education is a great example. The, the worst inner city school districts on a per pupil basis are the best funded. The idea that we don't, you could say, well, they need even more, more funding. That's an argument you can make. But the idea that they're not getting funded just isn't true. Similarly, but Section we, we 8 is a disastrous program for all sorts of reasons. The idea that you might want to think about a different way to help people with housing doesn't mean you don't think they need help. It means what we've been doing is really not working very well. Well, there's a difference between saying vouchers for public education uh, for education might be a better way to help poor kids and what ben carson has said which is that government programs don't help people in poverty in the private sector uh... would do it better but what's the alternative in the housing sphere what's the conservative federal housing program that might replace the current ones well so if, if you take housing in new york city as a as a very good example of what's wrong you know one problem is because it's funded at the federal level and run at the state level you have huge funding gaps. So we don't provide nearly enough funding to meet the needs of everybody who's supposed to be eligible in New York City. What that means is you have a massive wait list. You don't know how long it's going to be before you get in. And if you get in, you'd better not do anything like earn money that might kick you out because you go to the back of the line. Um, and so, for instance, turnout, turnover in public housing is on the order of only a couple of percentage points a year because if you actually get in, the incentive is to stay in. So even just realigning the structure to say, let's have the same people who define the funding, set the eligibility criteria, and make sure that they match so that we're not running a, a wait list based system, uh, would create much better incentives than what we have. Well, thank you all for being with us. Arne, you're going to stay with us as we bring on some additional evidence. Time for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold, hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. Since the Trump victory, there's been much criticism, some of it right here in our studio today, from those who fear that Donald Trump and a Republican Congress will fully reverse the legacy of President Barack Obama on issues from health care to global warming. Our next guest, however, sees a deeper historical shift from earlier policies that Obama once credited as the reason he was able to achieve this country's highest office, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. What was America like before LBJ's landmark legislation? And who would suffer from its undoing? American historian Josh Zeitz joins us. He's the author of Lincoln's Boys, John Hay, John Nicolay, and The War for Lincoln's Image. Zeiss is currently writing a book on the making of LBJ's Great Society. And Oren Cass stays with us. Welcome, Josh. 
Thank you. And I want to bring up an image from 1961. This is Ronald Reagan on an album cover. And as you can see, the album is called Ronald Reagan Speaks Against Socialized Medicine. So that was about four years before Lyndon Johnson's Medicaid and Medicare programs um, got enacted. So what was the political climate around the coming of those. Sure. Uh, it's worth noting that, that Medicare uh, was actually a, a holdover item from the Kennedy administration. When that album cover was, was put out, uh, the Kennedy administration was attempting to no great success to get Medicare and the, uh, early, uh, and the Aid to Early and Secondary Education Acts through Congress. It was Johnson who ultimately found the winning formulas to do that. I mean, this had, really the Great Society was the culmination of a 10 or 15 year ideological dispute between conservatives and liberals. Um, and it was not uncommon, it might have been uncommon to do uh, album covers, but it wasn't at all uncommon for conservative leaders and politicians to argue that federal aid to education was uh, just a gateway to federal control of education, um, top down, uh, or that uh, federal aid uh, were federally subsidized or, or provisioned uh, medical care for the elderly uh, was a gateway to socialized medicine, which was then a gateway to a, a more sort of perfidious, you know, Soviet-style system. So this is most certainly the type of critique that would have been familiar in that, in that earlier period. And let me also single out the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, that was also something that was coming through during the Kennedy years. Uh, That's right. Kennedy got killed in November of 1963, so clearly it was already in the works. But we think of civil rights as, you know, you can't discriminate at the Woolworth lunch counter in terms of uh, whether you serve black people there, too. But it's much more than that. It includes education, uh, includes women's rights, uh, all kinds of things, right? Most certainly. I mean, one thing I would point out is that all, all of these acts passed on a bipartisan basis. So there was, there was a, a strong contingent within the Republican Party that recognized a, a, an affirmative role for the federal government back in the mid-1960s, more so, I think, than there is today. But civil rights was a component of all of these things. I mean, um, to, be f to be fair to Ronald Reagan, indeed, when the government, you know, got into the business of, of helping to fund medical care for the elderly uh, and education uh, at the state and local level, it did begin to exert control over how hospitals, nursing homes, and schools uh, behaved, but it did so in a way that many of us would consider to be very civilized. So the Johnson administration, for instance, when it built Medicare, required all participating hospitals and nursing homes to desegregate their facilities, their staffs. They actually issued um, very firm rules um, that many conservatives today would probably find heavy-handed, but those rules demanded that hospital staff refer to African-American patients as Mr. and Ms. and to African-American paraprofessionals and doctors by their title. Um, so, you know, when we think about federal control um, being a condition of federal money, it's, it's worth noting that there are a lot of things that we probably consider to be a hallmark of a civilized society today that, that sprung from that. How much is it the agenda of conservative intellectuals, if I can generalize as a group, to roll back particular things of Lyndon Johnson as top priorities? Well, I think it's really important to distinguish between the structure of these programs and the goals of these programs. You know, I think what the Great Society sought to achieve in terms of putting a baseline standard of living below every American, making sure some basic needs were met, providing basic health care for everybody are things that conservatives, for the most part, are committed to today. I think what they take issue with is the structure that it was implemented under that, um, you know, as Josh mentioned, has certainly led to a very strong federal role in a lot of areas, but has also just proven unsustainable. You know, when you talk about the large, both existing budget deficits, but even more so looking forward, uh, unfunded liabilities, they are a direct result of the way things like Medicaid and Medicare are designed to function. And so a lot of reform energy is directed towards saying, how can we still provide these services, but in a way that leaves the market free to function where possible, let states make choices where possible, and make sure we don't bankrupt ourselves along the way. It was such a liberal era. There were block grants to cities to fight uh, mm -hmm. poverty their way. There was the advent of affirmative action, which Johnson talked eloquently about at the time. You can't uh, just tie somebody's legs behind their backs for 500 years and then say, okay, now you're equal in a race. Um, there was uh, the Immigration Act, which certainly is in mm -hmm. the sights of Donald Trump today, the Immigration Act of 1965, which really loosened how people could come into the country compared to the 40 years before that. So it was so defining those few years when Lyndon Johnson was president. 
Uh, certainly. I mean, you look at the context in which the Great Society programs were constructed. This was a period of, of enormous economic and uh, growth, uh, growth in economic output. Uh, Americans were still on a sugar high after having you know, defeated fascism in Europe and Asia and having pulled themselves out of the Great Depression. Um, there was a lofty sense of purpose and, and a sense that there were kind of boundless uh, expectations and boundless possibilities. You fast forward several decades, post-Vietnam, post-Watergate, um, for three decades now, we've had real economic stagnation, certainly in deep pockets of our country. Um, I don't think you have that same buoyant sense of, 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 uh, of can-do expectation that you did in the 60s. And so that helps to explain that, that politics of limitation helps to explain in some part um, why, why those arguing for a dismantling of the Great Society can find some traction. Is there a basic disagreement as to the nature of individual responsibility versus social responsibility that's really at the heart of almost everything that we're talking about here with the Great Society. That was all society is responsible for a lot of inequality. And conservative thinking is individuals are primary, primarily responsible. Uh, and the pendulum is swinging back toward that. I think that's a piece of it. I, I think the larger piece is the question of which solutions are actually more effective, which is to say, given the challenges we face, is a government-based um, handout is used pejoratively. I don't mean pejoratively. I mean, is the government sending someone a check or providing someone a benefit, uh, especially one that they're going to lose when they start working, the right way to help get people back on their feet? Um, and structurally is designing a single program in Washington uh, that's then implemented in a tangled way through the states the right way to actually deliver the services we want to deliver. So in our last minute, you wrote a book about Lincoln's cabinet. How about Trump's cabinet in the context of what we're talking about? Uh, they definitely seem like a team of rivals in some respect. Uh, it bears noting that Lincoln replaced his team of rivals with a much more uh, tight-knit group for his second term that obviously was cut short. I think he saw uh, ultimately that he preferred to have a cabinet that reported to him and uh, had his ideological interest in mind above all. But we'll, we'll see. It'll, it, it's certainly a fascinating group of people he's assembling. And did Lincoln listen to his cabinet when it was a team of rivals? Uh, more or less. It was a very different uh, use of the cabinet in the 1860s. They, they were really, uh, in some ways, much more autonomous. Today's, I, I think, Oren could tell you that today, I think it's a White House staff that has, in some ways, more influence over how policy develops than, uh, than cabinet agencies. All right. Do you agree, Orr? That's true. <laughs> Thank you both very much for joining us. Thank you. And that's POTUS 2016 for today. We're here each week at this hour. And after the new year, we become POTUS 2017. And we'll continue to keep watch on the Oval Office and to pour cold, hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.